physics, uh, but I was introduced to his work a couple years ago, even before I met him, with a few essays that he wrote on the topic of game field on Gamma Sutra. And that resulted in a book which I, I consider required reading for all game design. So today's scene is going to talk about, I guess, why experimental is hard. So, <laughs> So this is Shadow Physics. Um, it's kind of dead right now. So this talk is actually called Shadow Physics is Dead. Long live Shadow Physics. <laughs> and okay, so then the, the idea here is that you start not being able to understand that the things that you're on are projected by a shadow plane. And then the camera shifts when you open the curtain. It's a metaphor. <laughs> uh, about four months ago, I was in a really bad place uh, physically. I was working really, really hard on this game, and to be quite frank, it really wasn't going very well. And uh, I actually had a really bad ulcer. And I don't know if you ever had an ulcer before, but I actually really recommend against it if you can help it. <laughs> <laughs> It's really pretty obnoxious. It feels like there's this molten coal in your stomach that's trying to burn its way out. So basically, I was in a place where I could not do anything for more than two or three hours without just like unbelievable pain in my stomach. So I was basically sitting alone in the dark in my underwear, uh, not feeling that great about things. And there was like this brief period of a couple of weeks where I thought I had crazy throat cancer and I was going to die. And my mom was being like the least helpful, most mom, mom ever. And she was just like, every time I talked to her, it was like hushed tones, like, well, oh, we'll just have to wait and see what the results are. She had like a friend who died of crazy throat cancer. She's like, oh my god, mom, you're killing me. Um, perhaps literally. <laughs> uh, so I had some time to reflect, and I sat around and I thought about what we've been trying to do with this game and kind of what was going on with it. And you can see here, there's two shadows cast by this one box, and I can't kind of push it the way that I want to because of, well, you can see. But because I moved it forward with that other shadow, I can do this kind of thing. Yeah. And I can kind of push it over here. And you do. I'm just going to give you a little taste of kind of where the game is right now. Um, yeah, there are a lot of problems with this game, and one of the problems is that it demos really well, but it's like never been fun to play. <laughs> and it's really obnoxious to work on it for that reason, because there's this experience that I want the player to have, but I don't have that experience as the designer, and like I feel as though I spent a really long time thrashing around trying to just make it so that I could have the experience that I wanted the player to have, even in the developer tools with all the control that I had over everything. So here's a, a shadow of an object that's sort of long, and uh, I'll do that kind of thing with it. Kind of push it over here. And this is kind of a stupid thing that I was playing around with, but it, it's in here right now. I don't know why it's a green block, like this never really got arted. And this is a, a block that doesn't cast shadows, so that was an element we were sort of playing around with. And I don't know, I, I, I was getting really, really down on myself, and, and I was having one of those creative crises where I was basically asking myself if, 
if I was just totally not cut out to be a game designer at all and like, fuck, what am I doing with my life? And blah, 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 blah. I think pretty much everyone who's in here has made a game has been there at least once. Okay, it kind of comes with the territory, especially if you're an indie. This is a ball that bounces, so the shadow inherits the property of the object. So that was a, another sort of thread we were chasing down. Some enemies. Those dudes. Uh, this one's kind of lame. <laughs> uh, this is this sort of interesting thing where you can take a box and because it's a projected shadow, like it's a proper shadow, it's not fake the way that Lost in Shadow is. Um, it's not orthographic. You can do things like this, where the box will stretch across an area. Like the shadow kind of gets bigger, and that's kind of interesting. And these bird enemies with terrible placeholder animation will kill you if you just sort of walk through there. Uh, this is sort of like the classic puzzle that sort of started it. We need to take the bouncing off the ball because it kind of ruins the puzzle a little bit. And the feel of the bouncing is kind of funky. And I'll talk a little bit about game feel in this game and why I will never release this game in this form because it would be like the most hypocritical thing ever to release it. <laughs> <laughs> Since I literally wrote the book on game feel. Oh, okay. And you could die. <laughs> trying to get you to parse out what's happening in the foreground relative to the different lights. And actually what we really need here is light cones uh, coming from each light to show you where the light is in the 3D position. Uh, and we were almost had this working in there in some levels, but apparently not in this build. But anyway, so I sort of pushed that box over here and then I can kind of do that and get this key up here. If I'm awesome. Swinging lights are just inherently interesting, sort of a cool way to do moving platforms, right? And later on, you get to control the swinging lights, and that's pretty cool. But anyway, as I said, I was really fucking bummed out about this whole thing, and this was like the hardest talk I ever wrote because it was basically like I had I spent four months like healing up, and I got like a tube shoved down my throat, and there was like this whole period where I was afraid I was going to die. I was like, oh my god. Right up there, worst worst periods of my life. But then I just started to feel really good, and like this weight started to lift. And so like coming back into this is like, really cathartic, and I really appreciate you guys sitting for me, basically kind of unwinding my shit and <laughs> letting you letting you see it. Uh, yeah, anyway, multiple moving lights, kind of interesting. One problem we have right now is it's really hard to get the information you need to set the player's velocity to the identical velocity of an object that's in a shadow space projected from a light that's moving <laughs> and you can't fucking figure out how much it's moving or why or when. Like, you, we, we had some magic numbers and I like hard-coded a couple of times to try to get it working, but it just never uh, felt good enough. There's, this game, oh my god, I, I've worked on a fair number of games, not like a lot, not like Richard or whatever, but I've worked on a fair number of games and this game has like the most unfavorable ratio of time and energy put in to actual like result in interesting gameplay. And actually, I was kind of like, you know, I was like sitting alone in the dark in my underwear, just sort of being, you know, pondering it all and thinking, oh my god, like I never made anything cool in this game. But actually, I kind of feel kind of good about it now. Like now that I've gone through all these builds and like parsed out all these moments that we made, um, you know, I feel like it's not releasable because of a lot of weird problems that I'll talk about. But, I don't know, I, I sort of feel really good about it, and um, I really was worried that I had, like, let down all my friends who, who had uh, graciously helped me fund the game, and, and I was just, like, really bummed out about it, and I just kind of wanted to show that, actually, this was really amazing. This is, you know, the most amazing experience of my life, and <laughs> this morning... <laughs> I have my tea uh, here, which clearly means that my life is amazing, and so I should shut the fuck up and stop being a whiner. Like, it's ridiculous, right? I mean, it's a Venice Beach, right? So to get there, I had to be like, hobo, hobo, dead seagull, like, skateboarder, dead skateboarder, and so on. Um, but holy crap, man. My life is amazing, and our lives are amazing, and we live in the freest time 
in the freest place in the history of recorded you know, human endeavor, right? It's amazing how much freedom we have. And, you know, in this country we have national freedom, right? We've never been conquered. We get to set our destination as a nation, more or less, except we sort of have that co-opted in the last few years, which is kind of a bummer. We have political freedom. We can vote or not vote, and we can say whatever the fuck we want, which is awesome. We have personal freedom. That's pretty cool. Right? <laughs> we basically get to do whatever we want, as long as we harm no one else, right? We live under the umbrella of natural law. Uh, but there's kind of a problem with the fact that we get to do whatever we want, and that is that uh, mostly what we do with this freedom is that we get fat, lazy, and stupid. Uh, and I thought a fair amount about why this is, and I think it's because of distraction. And there's kind of this trajectory in the media that we consume and the, the ways that we interact with media. Um, and it kind of started with this, right? And if you've read The Assault on Reason, that Al Gore book, it's actually really good, and he really gets into a lot of, like, neuroscience topics, and he's clearly done his homework, and it comes through, and it's wonderful, and it's very interesting, and it's sort of like about how TV has reshaped what it means to be a human being, sort of through the lens of his kind of thing. He had this great passage in there that I found really eye-opening, where he said that, you know, early in his political career, he would think about how to have a message that would affect people's hearts and minds, and when he was running for the governorship, or whatever, what the highest office he had before he was vice president, he had a group of advisors and they came in and they said, if we release this ad with this content at this time, your percentage will go up this number of points, your opponents will go down this number of points, and you will win this election. And it will cost this much money. And he was like, wow. <laughs> so then this came along. <laughs> and we're still trying to figure out what the fuck we're doing with this thing even, right? And, and this radically reshaped the way that we digest media and it provides all kinds of new ways to distract you totally apart from this and this, which are sort of more recent on the scene and are really pretty insidious as far as the amount of uh, distraction that they provide on a daily basis and the amount of time that you spend just purely wasting time on them. Just like websites, browsing websites, right? You know, that can be a really addictive behavior. And now we have like this, right, which takes all of these and puts them in your pocket so that they follow you wherever you go and you can't escape them, and they're like these constant nags. Uh, so in our society right now, to be human is to be distracted, uh, and people joke about being addicted to Facebook and Twitter, like, oh, I'm addicted to Twitter, lol. But I actually think that in that laughter, there's kind of this sad plea, and it's like, what am I doing with my life? Like, help me escape from this. Like, I'm clearly, you know, right? It's kind of a problem. And I have no internet in here, but if I did, I was going to tab over and start tweeting in the talk. Anyway. Um, so I kind of think that, yeah, oh, you can't read that. It says, oh, gee, I'm totally checking snake right now. <laughs> Cat picture. Okay, so, I, could be, I, I should be not susceptible to this stuff. We should not be susceptible to the Twitter and Facebook, right? We're game designers. We understand this shit. We know how to use reward schedules and, and systems to, to engage players. Uh, but, you know, I am, right? I, I convince myself that I like Twitter. And that I like to have this constant nag pulling me back all the time to check the number of followers that I have and whatever stupid shit I posted if someone retweeted it and so on. Um, but I don't. I'm a slave to Twitter and kind of a sad way. And, and Facebook, right? And Facebook is interesting because it, it like does provide this really valuable thing sometimes when somebody's like, oh my god, this person I haven't seen in a bunch of years just had a baby. And it's like, oh, here's my baby, and that's awesome. And my friend from high school got like the most regrettable sleeve tattoo of like zombies ripping this girl apart. And I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. But those moments are very fleeting. Um, so a couple of months ago, I quit Twitter for 30 days, and I was like, wow, the difference in my life was unbelievable. Not only did my productivity go up, but it felt way better about myself as a person. Like I was a more moral person. Like I was like a master of my own domain, right? It was amazing. Um, and I know I'm not alone in feeling this way about Twitter and Facebook sometimes. And I think that we need to listen to our hearts here. And I, I think that in 50 years we may look back at Twitter and Facebook and some games that lots of people think are really good games and we may kind of think about them the way that we think about cigarettes today. Uh, cigarettes take away your health and money and give you nothing in return. And um, obsessive use of social networks and video games uh, in particular takes away something even more insidious. It takes away the finite, irreplaceable hours of your life, right? And there's this idea 
that with Twitter and Facebook, we're more connected than we've ever been, but I think that the character and quality of those connections is highly questionable. Now, I would never tell you you can't smoke. I would never tell you you can't drink or eat whatever you want. I would never tell you you can't use social networks. You know, you're all adults. And I would defend very vigorously, like, your ability to make that choice, right? I would, I would, if our country started trying to regulate that shit, you know, we'd be out on the streets, obviously. But here's a, a sort of important and subtle distinction. I would never be an executive at Marlboro or McDonald's or, you know, the manager of a casino. So I guess the point is that you can't abdicate responsibility for the things that you put out into the world. As a game designer, you are culpable for the resultant behavior of your designs. And I think I'm sort of preaching to the choir in this room, but, you know, I felt like talking about this, so you have to listen to me. This is perhaps, arguably, one of the most unfortunate human beings that's ever lived. We can say pretty much without qualification that if Thomas Midgley Jr. had never lived, the world would be a better place. It's kind of like Goebbels and, uh, you know, other people like that. <laughs> Thomas Midgley Jr. was the inventor of tetraethyl lead, which was basically lead, liquefied, and put into gasoline. And it was, in, it was to stop the, the condition known as engine knock. So basically your car's engine wouldn't be as loud and jittery and would pull together better. Tetraethyl lead is the reason why every human being on the face of the planet Earth today has about 50 times the concentration of lead in your bloodstream uh, than the people did before Thomas Midgley Jr. lived. He was also the inventor, if you can believe it, of chlorofluorocarbons. <laughs> <laughs> this fucking guy, right? <laughs> so I kind of think that the world would be better if Singa didn't exist. Um, they're not like as bad as Thomas Midgley Jr., obviously, and there's a huge amount of nuance, and there's a lot of people who get a lot of enjoyment out of, uh, you know, playing Zynga games, kind of, but I think we can all agree that they're very far on the end of the spectrum that doesn't give a fuck about giving people meaningful, enjoyable experiences and really cares much more about just, like, making money off of people sort of farming them like they're sheep. So in our field, I think there's a lack of appreciation, not necessarily in this room, but, but in our field generally, there's a lack of appreciation for the power of the cultural force that we wield. Um, I think it has the power to reshape humanity in a really profound way. It can reshape what it means to be human. We've seen it happen with media already. It's, it's a very obvious thing. And this power is already in action. Everything that we make changes what it means to be a human being, right? And it's a really awesome and humbling responsibility, and it really should be. Uh, but I don't think it is for a lot of people. And, and in designing video games, to some degree, what you're creating is a system intended to exploit the human perceptual system. And just the way that kind of film before has, has sort of hacked your perceptual system into seeing a series of frames displayed quickly as moving images and so on, I think that you know, video games in a lot of ways are intended to create feedback loops that give the impression of control, or the impression of mastery or progress and meaningful achievement and so on. So we're in the business of activating players' reward centers um, and apply there are certain best practices in game design that, that are used to maximize this activation. And if you're a game designer and you don't use these things, then you're a shitty game designer and you're going to be left in the dust, right? Like, that's just how it is. Uh, you will lose the engagement arms race. But you can still design experiences, and I think we all agree, that give players something beautiful or meaningful uh, in ex or thoughtful in exchange for their time. And a lot of people have pointed out, uh, Jonathan Glow, I think, first like articulated this in a talk, the, the subtle but important difference between go, setting out to make the player feel clever and actually making something that requires the player to, to be clever to solve it, right? Um, I think this concept extends to every type of game. <coughs> Cleverness applies to puzzles, but every structure and grouping of mechanics contains the decision to some degree. And, and it sort of can be synopsized as genuine versus false experience. Because, you know, <laughs> you can make things that that respect the player and treat them like a thinking, feeling, intelligent human being. Uh, and and a, a meaningful experience might be a real difficult challenge to overcome, or it might be a subtle, contemplative moment, or it might be an expression of inexpressible feelings. Like, there are things we can express through our media that we can't express in any other media, and we don't even have words for them, right? Because they, they live in the place between a player and a game, and that sort of system dynamic. And I, I kind of feel like this is the battle for the soul of game design, right? Like, <laughs> meaning versus money. What do we want to be? Do we want to be casino owners, or do we want to be, you know, meaningful contributors to the legacy of what it means to be a human being? Um, and it's kind of up to us to care, really, like, because no one's going to care for us. And again, I'm sort of appreciative of the choir here, because I look around the room and I see 
all kinds of people who have made really beautiful things that I fucking love. Um, but I, I feel like it's worth saying that we should fight the impulses to take the easy way out and we should exercise craft and discipline. And I, I like to synopsize this just by sort of saying, just design without greed, right? If you take greed out of the equation, you're no longer worried about what tools you're employing to sort of hook into the human perceptual mechanisms. And I think the key to all this is that some work has been done on me. I'm changed by every piece of media that I consume, and for better or worse, right? And some have changed really profoundly the way that I interact with the world and what, who I am as a human being, and they've made me become a better person. Um, and to say that a book or a film or a piece of music has inspired me to create is probably the, the biggest compliment that I can give it, right? And I, I think a lot of people here would agree. So, I'm going to show you some earlier builds of shadow physics, and I want to kind of just create this kind of cluster concept in your mind about what we try to do and how it was approached from this idea of making beauty and meaning, uh, and, and I'll talk about kind of how we failed <laughs> and what the important and interesting lessons potentially are from that. This is the logo for me. So one really neat thing in shadow physics, probably the, the core neat thing, is that things that you take for granted can be engaged in different ways, right? So all of a sudden, a shadow, which is fundamentally just a residue of light in an object in certain positions, becomes meaningful and interesting. So this is an early build where we're experimenting with making the levels kind of feel bigger and have more things in them. And I felt like it was really important to make all the objects in the world real objects, or at least analogous of real objects. And this created an unbelievable amount of headaches. And so it's very, I, I very much question whether this was a good design decision, but I feel like it had to be made this way because one of the most interesting things about shadows is that they make everyday objects appear different. And if you, if you embed affordances into everyday objects that weren't there before, that's something sort of cool and magical. Sensor object. It knows when it's covered with the shadow, although it's not the shadow's not rendering on top of it right now. And it activates something, so later on we have lights that are turned on and off, things that move, so on, by uh, uh, objects covering them. And that was like kind of cool enough. Alright, well, I'm gonna talk about collision glitches now. <laughs> it was a really big problem in this game. Uh, we made a platformer, uh, but it's really hard to make a good feeling platformer, um, period. And then basically if you take away any sort of like tile based thing, that makes it that much harder to make, right? And then if you take away an ability to understand what the character will be walking on in any given frame, then it becomes that much harder, right? Because the world can warp and distort in very unpredictable ways programmatically. And it's really hard to keep track of that shit, which is basically the opposite of what you want for good feeling platform. Plus, we made the character tall and lanky. Um, and the reason we did that is because if you have a short, fat character, their limbs don't cross over themselves very much. And when you have a character who can move on to projected surfaces and inherits the texture of that surface at some level, and also um, you know, gets sort of wildly distorted, you're in a place where it's really hard to sell character through animation, and it's really hard to have a sense of who this character is, which you should have. So that's why I ended up being tall and lanky, but of course that's really bad for a platform. Um, it's really hard to make it feel good. Where is that? So this is an earlier version of that other puzzle, which I actually think is better. There's this really weird thing that happened as we worked on this game. It's basically like, I would have these cool moments that I really liked that we would make, and then everything would get torn apart, and I'd have to remake them, and they wouldn't be as good. And what it indicated to me was that the very precise relationship of an object of light and a shadow made it really hard to sort of predictably 
construct something that would behave the way that you think it would and therefore would be you know controllable enough by me as a designer to be cool. You can nest objects inside one another. It's kind of cool. So there's all these interesting little ideas. And um, <laughs> and I think maybe this game wants to be a series of interesting moments like this. I think there should be some challenging puzzles in here. I can talk a little bit about puzzle design later on. Just sort of generally what good puzzle design is and good puzzle design and experimental mechanics. But I kind of think that maybe this game just wants to be a series of moments. It maybe doesn't want to be a bunch of really hard puzzles or interesting puzzles. It just might want to be a bunch of interesting interactions. So we have this idea that objects that were large in the shadow space would be hard for the character to push. And I feel like this idea never really got realized, and it could be really cool. But anyway, this is an example that I can't push these big dominoes because the shadows are too big. But I can push this little one right here, and there go the dominoes. And now I can get back. Kind of. Feels like crap, but at least the idea is. I'm going to talk a little bit more about craft and discipline later, but here's a, a really good example. We have this idea of multiple characters, and there's not really a reason for there to be multiple characters other than one object can cast multiple shadows, right? Uh, and it has some interesting things, but it's not really what the game is about, like the core of the game. So that's kind of a problem. The core of the game, I think, really should be about this. Which is moving lights around in some sensible, constrained way that doesn't just feel like you're flopping shit around. Because like, I don't know if you guys play Echo Chrome 2, which is a very interesting game, um, and for some weird reason has the same art treatment as our original Shadow demo, which I don't understand. Um, but it, it reduces to mashing, and I'll talk about that more in relation to other games. You know, you have the, the uh, move remote, and you kind of mash it around until the thing forms into what it's supposed to be, and then you, know, you go from there. And it, it sort of quantizes the puzzle solving in a way that's not that cool or fun or interesting, in my opinion. <coughs> so my original vision for the game was only a platform where you play as a shadow. And there's actually one big fundamental problem with this as a, as a design conceit, as a starting point for trying to make a, a long, meaningful, interesting experience. And the problem is, uh, it's not a verb. You are a shadow. It doesn't imply any particular action, right? And I think if you want to make really badass puzzles and really cool stuff happen, you need to, have, you know, fundamentally start at a point where what you're constructing is based on a novel mechanic and, and branches out from there. And we have, we've struggled a lot trying to make the fundamental verbs of shadow physics interesting. It sort of evolved to be about the relationship between light and shadow and how light works and how a particular object will cast a particular shadow given parameters plus the shape of the object it projects onto. Um, and that's pretty cool, but that's really counterintuitive. That is not something that most people are good at. And this is a, a little guide by Nicholas Janssen, uh, Prom or Arne, if, you, if you've seen any of his work, he did like the art for Cortex Command and, and other stuff. Um, and he basically says that there's no way to, to get your brain to see that stuff properly. The only way to be a really good artist and be able to render light and shadow properly is to learn a set of rules and really follow them stringently. And he says whenever he branches off from that, even though he's this amazing, experienced artist, it just screws everything up. So anyway, here's some more sort of moving light stuff. There's this idea where you have this object that casts a shadow but is a light attached to it, so you can sort of move the object in the light itself, um, which is kind of interesting. You can like, get these little guys out of here and they're sort of glitchy collision and it's weird, but whatever. And if you push the thing over here, there's like a face that forms out of here. That's kind of cool. And that was another thing that we were really interested in doing. There's a lot of shadow artwork that's really cool and interesting that I have slides up in a second. We were playing around with like multiple shadows, and that seemed to be pretty fruitful. Like you can push the same uh, two different shadows of the same object to 
achieve certain results, which is really interesting. So like I can stand over here, push this here thing, and then if I'm quick enough, I can get it there, and so on. It's a little bit fiddly. A lot of stuff in this game refuses to a little bit fiddly, which is kind of a problem. Um, that had more to do with the physics than the shadows. <coughs> So here's like some examples of that shadow art, which is really fucking cool, right? It's, it's this idea that everyday objects can be combined to create something that they weren't before. And we actually explored this a fair amount. And it sort of got combined with this idea, which is that a shadow can define a space, right? So, so you can have a detail on a wall, and then the shadow can kind of define the space of, of that. So this kind of boiled down to this. So here we have another iteration of the animation of the character, and now it's like tuned so that his jump is a lot less. And I felt like I, I kept just being boxed in by technological constraints. So I don't want to get too crazy with it, but basically what happens in Shadow Games is you have a, a light source, right, and it projects against a wall, and it creates a shadow space, and the, there's a shader that knows about all the shadows that are on that wall, and then there's another shader that projects from a light position, just like a light, and that's like where the guy comes from, and he's projected against the wall. And the size of that is like this unbelievable performance bottleneck. So the smaller you can get that, the cooler the guy looks, and the better it performs and the faster it goes and all that sort of thing. And it's like, oh my god, like it just kept like nur, 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 nur. and so I started like tuning the guy so he didn't jump as much because even though it didn't feel as good, like I needed more of the shadow space and the performance was getting all crappy. And it's like, oh god, what a, what a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, anyway, this is kind of interesting. So I these are swinging lights that you can push, which is kind of cool. And uh, I have this outline. And if I can push this object, there we go. I think you can kind of see what this is. Synced up just right, it'll actually create a shadow butterfly out of this. But you can see there's like a lot of fiddly, annoying problems with this. Uh, just do it. <laughs> Alright, well, I can show you another level what happens when you actually put this all together. Um, and the swinging lights are interesting, right? Pretty cool. Like, just generally. But one interesting thing to note about them is that there's no actual decision in the swinging of the light. There's like a little bit of softness in how much you, tr you push on the light to swing it. But it actually doesn't constitute a meaningful step in a puzzle or a decision because if you see the light, you're going to push it, right? So then we started doing things where the lights were already moving because obviously that's kind of silly. But this is kind of interesting. Right? The shadow of this ladder is going to swing over and I can like, climb it and get this key. If I can do it. There we go. And then I have to kind of wait for this shadow to cover. But this stuff, I mean, this stuff took way, way long to make. <laughs> to, like, to make that work. It's just so fiddly. That was really interesting, I thought. Because it, it creates a really interesting moment. And it's cool to like, show it to people, but it's not that much fun to me. So, <coughs> I looked at all the levels that I built, and it's actually like 180-something. 
Um, and here's a here's a, a takeaway tip for you from this talk. If you're working on an experimental game with an experimental mechanic and you're making lots of stuff, and every single level design that you have starts like this. then the wheels are coming off. <laughs> because uh, I couldn't just like play around with the system and look at what was cool that came out of it. It was always me imposing my will on the system, and it was painful. And it was just killing me and, in kind of a literal way, like my stomach started to hurt, right? Um, and, and we just really like try to force it, and really what we need to do is just take a step way back and say, okay, the fundamental parameters of the system we're building here, we have to put way more into it than we're getting back out of it. And that's a really big problem, right? So, I'm just going to kind of wrap up by saying, in the end, all we really have is the fleeting moments of our lives. And as I said earlier, there's a finite number of irreplaceable hours in the human life. And it kind of makes sense with that point of view to fill those hours with something meaningful and interesting and remarkable. Uh, we, we string those moments together, and that's the story of our lives, what we are, you know, who we became, what we wanted to be. And gathering those wonderful moments together is awesome, and everyone should do it, but it really uh, feels hollow unless we leave something behind. And sometimes I feel really crappy, like I'm not doing everything that I should be doing, and I am not leaving anything behind, and it, it's like this nagging, gnawing desire, and I know, I know a lot of people in here have experienced that. And so you can't even enjoy your leisure time, you can't take a vacation, it's just like this, this unbelievable sort of crushing thing. And it ruins pleasures that other people just kind of take for granted. Um, and as I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about what I was talking about earlier, sort of the soul of game, designer, game designers, and, and how that sort of pertains to the, the, the future of humanity generally, kind of maybe just like stick, stick a step back and wonder about the, the fundamental value of any human activity. Uh, and it's supposed to be to like a really big part of my own value system, and it kind of ended up here. Uh, and this is a quote by Bill Bryson. I read his book, A Short History of Nearly Everything is for the Ground. Um, but it was, that quote is, pertains to the Principia, right? In which Newton outlined general mechanics. Whatever, you know what I mean. Um, the fundamental basis of physics right, for many years. And this, of course, is a quote about Einstein. So I kind of think that the hours that Einstein spent formulating his theories of time and space were the most important hours ever spent by a human being on the face of the planet, right? So that's interesting. Uh, and how about a more artistic example? So Mozart writing the aria for the Queen of the Night. Do you guys remember that tune? Anybody? All right, here we go. This is going to be rough, but I thought I would have a microphone. <laughs> it's kind of shrilly a little here. And you're okay. So you're, you're thinking, what the fuck is this? I don't recognize it. So how many times have you heard a cell phone ring at the airport or a train station and you've heard that tune, right? You don't, even, you don't even probably have to know what the name of it is to know that that is a nice tune. Um, so these creations, which came from individual human minds, uh, make ripples that even today we experience, right? And in the best cases, they enrich our lives, and they enrich the lives of every living human being. And if we erase them from the history of the human race, then we would all lose something. We'd lose something fundamental about what it means to be a human being. So I would argue that these people created meaning, and they spent their lives doing that, and they really concentrated on it. And I don't think that if you read the biographies of any of these people, or even just intuitively, you would argue that they didn't struggle. <coughs> they, that these beautiful things that we still have today came from struggling and from a desire to make something beautiful. And most of these people did what they did for the glory of God, right? Like that was Newton's whole thing. And that's not a very popular message in our highly secular age. But you don't have to think about it in those terms. It's just you wanted to make something really beautiful. And that was kind of his way of saying that. And I, I think that 
Mozart made music just for the simple, pure joy of making something really beautiful that would inspire other people. And that this is designing without greed, I think. So there is no formula, and there's no methodology. And you can come to a talk and listen to someone tell you how to make games or give you one opinion about how they should be made. But really, the process is you look inside yourself. There are only ideas and creative output. And when you sit down in front of this, or this, or this, there's just you, right? All alone with the immensity that everything's, that, uh, of everything that any human has created for you. Uh, Johannes Brahms is my favorite classical composer. Fuck you, I'm a favorite classical composer, I'm not pompous. <laughs> he called this the Tramp of Giants, and he would chuck unbelievable amounts of his compositions just right into the fire. That was the only copy of it, now it's gone. Poof. Right? He was tormented by this idea of releasing something that was, in his mind, inferior to compositions by his heroes, Brahms, uh, Beethoven, Mozart, and Bach. Uh, and especially he loved his Burns symphonies and string quartets, which were forms that were perfected by those composers. Um, and this is what it takes sometimes, man. This shit is painful. And, and we're our own worst critics. Like, obviously, this is a graph by Kyle Gabler that, that succinctly summarizes something that I think all creative people who work in this kind of way experience. And it's the terrible dichotomy, right? It's like, how to give a fuck about what you're making and really care without just being totally crushed by it. Um, but we have to be our harshest critics at some level. Like, who else can know what your innermost expressive desires are, right? No one else can see the real you, the person who stares back at you when you have an empty coat window or a blank canvas. Um, and so I think people who want to make meaning apply constraints to their designs. And people who are at the forefront of a creative medium apply more stringent constraints. And they apply particular types of constraints. Um, and I think it's those self-applied constraints that torment us and flay our views and leave us breathless and gasping. And wondering if we're in the right media at all, and, and if we're not just banging ourselves against this thing that we have no inherent talent for. And that's fairly autobiographical, if you can't tell. I, can, I sort of feel that every time I sit down to make a game. So in creating Shadow Physics, we self-applied a bunch of really aggressive constraints, and I'm really proud of us for doing that. I think the result was more self-punishment than it was um, resulted in really awesome shit in this instance. But I think there is a cool game there. So I'm just going to go over the constraints that we applied, and this is sort of my conception of experimental game design. Um, first, choose a new mechanic. Novel, interesting, something that's never been done before. I think what this really boils down to is seeing things a different way, right? I think that you can look at Braid, and you can look at Blinks the Time Sweeper, and you can say, well, Blinks the Time Sweeper did Time Rewind before Braid did, but I think that's really, really missing the point, right? Because obviously Braid looks at time manipulation differently than it links the Time Sweeper or you know, the Prince of Persia's Hands of Time or whatever. Another one is don't accept the first right answer. Explore, delve really deeply. You know, this is Chris uh, Pecker talked about this I think last year or the year before. You know, finish your game. That's kind of I think the message he was trying to get. And the problem here is that it takes a long time to do that usually. Um, I think that if you're on the right track and things are going really well and stuff's just falling out of it, that's a way better position to be in. But just generally, I think it takes a long time even if you're in that positive position. And it takes a lot of uh, personal will to keep going after you kind of glom onto the first good feeling right answer that sort of kind of works, right? To, to set that aside and to keep going. Uh, this is Richard Wagner. Richard Wagner wrote The Ring of the Nibelung which is a 16-hour-long uh, cycle of four epic four-hour-long operas uh, about the, the, the uh, Ring of the Nibelung, which is a you know, mythology. Dude, he's batshit. <laughs> they, like, I've tried to listen to that, and I got through like three and a half hours of the first one, and there, I didn't find anything that was memorable about it. And it's all, it's, it's meant to be like the, the art of the new, I'm combining narrative with music and all this kind of stuff, but there's just nothing that, you know, kicks there. I think we need to exercise craft and discipline. We want to be Johannes Brahms, right? Because he could write a piece of music that would get your booty moving, and you'd only have to listen to it for an hour, or you can subdivide it into individual movements, right? And that shit was hot. <laughs> <laughs> the craft part of exercising craft and discipline is to remove all filler content. 
you got to discard a ton of content if you want to end up with a bunch of really good stuff. But you got to discard everything that doesn't sort of support your central thesis. It's kind of like persuasive writing. Right? It's like you have your thesis, it needs to be supported by evidence and reasons that resonate really well with that particular thesis, if you want to look at it that way. The discipline part is never to recycle ideas. Right? Even if you have this amazing idea, right? some moment in shadow physics that I thought was just totally rad, I can't just make an entire game out of that repeated over and over again. Right? As has been said before, there's value in restatement, but not in repetition. Most people don't worry about this kind of stuff. And I feel really good about the friends that I have, and I think one of the reasons we connect as much as we do is because we do care about this stuff. And I know that looking out here, I can see a lot of people give a crap about this. Right. And for designers of video games, and most filmmakers, and most um, people who write music and stuff, the rig rigorous application of constraints is just not that important. They make things that people think, or that they think that people like, and they make things that have been successful before, but they're tweaking the formula slightly and so on. Um, and they are successfully, financially and professionally, and they're awarded these sort of Game of the Year awards by their peers, and that's really cool for them, and they feel really good about it. Um, and I don't want to take that away from them. But I do think that, well, who awards Game of the Year anyway? It seems like there's 10 Game of the Year every year. Anyway, um, but I do think that, that, that often in our medium, craft is mistaken for art. And, and I don't even want to get into the art debate, whatever, but you know what I mean, right? Like a really well-crafted game floats to the top always. But there's this thing about these Games of the Year that they don't often stick, right? The year comes and goes, and these games are gone. And... Like, when was the last time you played a game that was five years old, or ten years, even twenty or thirty years old, right? Like, there are very, very few games that resonate across, you know, twenty years that we still would be interested in playing today that really are part of the conversation. And so, kind of, last time I talked about Shadow Physics in GC China, I showed a couple demos for games that I had made, and I tried to draw this distinction between games that are based on a concept, so that yeah, a game on top is this unreleased thing that I should probably release called inputting, and basically it's a series of levels, and on every level there is a different uh, input scheme, and you have to figure it out, and that's kind of the game. And then this is a prototype I made called Scale, that allows you to scale up and down any object in the world as much as you want uh, within a constrained space. And I was sort of trying to draw this um, distinction between the two, and I think that's actually a stupid distinction, and I really missed the lesson there, so I want to share that with you now. I think the important practical step there is the deep exploration. I think you can take an idea or a concept or a feeling or an emotion or anything as long as you are com committed to it and you're going to explore it deeply and it can be badass, right? Um, but I think actually the most important element in creating this type of thing is the underlying philosophy. And after working on an experimental game for a couple of years, I kind of think that constraints are just an artifact of an application of uh, an underlying philosophy, and that's really what's the most important, is to have a philosophy of creation. And I would never presume to tell you what your philosophy of creation should be, but I will say that I think you should have one if you want to create meaning, right? So if you want to create something that will stand the test of time, or even have a chance of doing that, then I think you have to have some sort of idea driving. So Chris Crawford once observed that all of our games, or most of our games, are about things instead of people, right? And to advance the medium, he said, I think we need to make games about people rather than things, and we need to focus on people. And I think he's right, but I think that the people we need to focus on are ourselves. Um, and I think the result of our creations is unknowable, right? Like Mozart's music was not popular music in its time. It was new, it was regarded as overly academic, overly complex, not fit for the general uh, hearing public, right? But you just can't plan for that kind of beauty, and, and you can struggle, and you can make beautiful things, and success is just kind of like the sensation that's internal to you, and it's too often based on all these external factors, and you know, we have to make money also, or we're going to starve, we have to do all this shit. And I just want to say that there's really no formula, no methodology, there's just people and our creative output, and if you're making something, you're doing awesome, like keep making shit, that's like the ultimate heuristic, but also be fucking ruthless in the way that you look at your own creations, and don't be afraid to just like kick the crap out of yourself from time to time, because I think that's where really awesome shit happens. Because if you sit down, and you have that mindset, and all of a sudden you create something that pops up on the screen, and you're like, oh wow, that's great, and you have this unbelievably stringent set of constraints that you're applying, then I think you know you've made something really meaningful, and I don't think it matters if anyone recognizes it or not. 
like generally speaking. So, design without greed. That's my Marcel Duchamp. Thank you.
maybe something that you don't know the answer, or maybe something that you don't know what the results are going to be, and, and if, you, if you're doing that, you're going to be faced with failure. Um, I wonder how you emotionally deal with that so that you can not let it destroy your work process when you when you encounter failure, when you encounter, when you put all this work into the level and it doesn't work, when yeah. anything like that happens. How do you um, get back to work the next day? There are a bunch of interesting hacks. If you get really into personal development, there's actually, when you sort through all the pseudo-religious bullshit, there's a couple really interesting things. Time boxing has been really great for me. It sort of takes the emotion out of failure. It's just, I'm going to work for the next hour on this one particular thing on my task list. And even if I'm just staring at a blank window of code and counting the number of times that the cursor blinks, I'm going to sit here and stare at this fucking thing until this hour is up. And inevitably what happens is you get dissatisfied with that arrangement and you start doing stuff. And then before you know it, three hours have gone by and you have something that either works or doesn't work, but you've made something. And that's sort of the ultimate heuristic. Uh, I think that the longer answer is that like pretty much all creators of independent games have at least some like heavy depressive tendencies and we tend to vacillate a little bit. I don't think there aren't very many people who don't get really, really down on themselves sometimes. But I think that's one of the huge benefits of having conferences like this and having friends and you know having people to there to tell you that no matter what happens this is just a valley and there will be hills again and, and you know, life goes on and this too shall pass. It's really hard though. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's easy at all and there are ways around it from a productivity standpoint that work 100% of the time. But, I mean, yeah, it's, it's very emotionally draining. And actually, I think uh, one big mistake that I made when I was working on Shadow Physics was not to let that out more. I always felt like I had to guard the fact that I was just... Like, I felt like I was, you know... <coughs> playing the, the violin on the Titanic as it was going down sometimes. And I think that was a lot of the result of, of one of the reasons why I ended up with an ulcer and all those other problems physically where I just like was bedridden for a month and a half just because I never like let that out and express it and stuff like that. I felt like I couldn't, but hey, you know, lesson learned there. All right, are we done? Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. right after this.